Welcome into the Miami Herbert Huddle. I'm your host, Rich Robinson. Today's show is all about NBA arenas, how they make money, and how they're operated in the modern era. Our guest, Kim Stone, the general manager of the Chase Center in San Francisco. A state-of-the-art facility that opened in 2019, the Chase Center is owned by the Golden State Warriors. Stone spent over 20 years working her way up the Miami Heat organization and left in 2019 to lead the opening of the Chase Center. But as you're about to hear, it hasn't always been easy. For people who don't know about the business of sports, which is what our show is all about, why are stadiums so critical to a team, a franchise, an organization's bottom line? Why do they matter? It allows you to control the experience for your guest. So here at Chase Center, our experience is based on a real premium level experience. And that means then that we can also control and, and get a little bit more in our ticket price for our ticket revenues, right? Most sports teams generate the vast majority of their revenues on an annual basis from the events at the venue. So it's ticket sales, it's corporate partnerships. So having a venue that you control, and we're fortunate, we're privately owned and privately operated, that's very unique. But we're, so we're very, we control every aspect of the experience. And when we open, um, we open to rave reviews for our guest service and our guest experience. And so, you know, having the control, having control over those revenue streams, having control over the experience, and having control over the calendar too, that matters. I mean, we have concerts here um, as well. You know, we're programmed to do 200 events a year. So what's interesting is we're programmed to do 200 events a year. That's what our business is based on. Only 50, depends on how many playoff games we have, but only 52-ish will be NBA games. So the vast majority of the events are other events, but we are proud to be the home of the Golden State Warriors. As a matter of fact, I'm an employee of the Golden State Warriors. So it's a, that's the reason teams want to have at least operational control. In Miami, at American Airlines Arena, the team has the operational rights and the county owns the venue. So there's lots of different partnerships uh, throughout the NBA. And there are some teams like the Boston Celtics who are just tenants at uh, TD Garden. The venue itself is um, run by the Boston Bruins, the hockey team. So there's lots of different aspects. Um, the Lakers, they are tenants at Staples Center, um, which is you know really, really interesting. Uh, but we've had great success and this organization wants to grow into a sports and entertainment company. And you do that through getting into uh, running your own venue. And we aren't just an arena. We, we sit on 11 acres. We have 29 retail restaurant spaces. So we're a whole, we want to be a destination in San Francisco. So we, we have visions and, and plans in place to, to be that, to be more than just, you might come to, we call it Thrive City, uh, to just come to one of our great restaurants, or you might come to come to an event, or you might come to just like, maybe we'll have a beer festival. So that was a long answer to your question. Um, but th those are the mechanics and the reasons uh, behind what we've done here in San Francisco. I know you're, you're focused on the one side of the business, of course, which is the physical place of, of the Chase Center. But to give a kind of a general idea for, for our listeners, uh, an NBA team makes money a number of different ways, right? They make money through revenue sharing in the league. They make money through uh, sports uh, t television rights. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of how much of the bottom line of a team it, it comes from the stadium itself or the, you know, the, the venue and selling merchandise at the arena, selling food and drink at the arena? Do you have a rough idea of how, how large of a percentage that is to a team? I do. Uh, and probably some of your listeners, if they've been following a lot of the sports uh, media during this COVID, you, you're, you're seeing teams announcing what it means to not have fans in their venues, right? And that's the impact. So there's, it, it's a little complex answer um, because they're so, the two businesses are so interwoven, the arena operations and then the team business operations are very interwoven. Um, from a per, I probably could give you like a percentage maybe. Um, it's there because there are intangibles um, as well. So like ticket sales, for example, the revenue from ticket sales lands on the team business side. And that, that's across the board. That, it was that way in Miami as well. And so those, the ticket revenue is valuable. So that, that stays with them. So then from a, a Warriors game, for example, my P&L 
is food and beverage, parking, and some of those what we call ancillary revenues, right? So clearly they aren't as high as the ticket ticket totals are. But then I also get, so I get, I make my revenues off of the 200 events, right? Where the, the this is an oversimplification, um, but teams in venues typically make their ticket revenue off of the games they have. And, 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 and artists, when we have concerts, artists t uh, keep the ticket revenue, we get all the ancillary revenue. So it's a, it's a extreme oversimplification of a complex um, financial relationship. But I would say there's, you know, there's a reason teams seek to open their own venues and control. The, the biggest thing is to control um, the venue, the operations of the venue. Now, not to get too wonky, but I, we want to get a little wonky. Does a, <laughs> does a sports team prefer, and you've now had a lot of uh, experience with the Heat, with Golden State, and then I know you were involved with the launch of the Miami Soul WNBA franchise, so you've been across uh, leagues even. Uh, by and large, does a league, would they rather s have season ticket holders or would they rather sell individual game tickets to fans? What, what is better for the team? Oh, it's definitely the season ticket holder base. Um, you, you build the loyalty. Those are, you know, revenues they lock in for an entire year. They don't buy on an individual game basis, right? It lowers your risk. Um, so they, season ticket members are invaluable. And they're, they're where your loyalty comes from. They are, in Miami, I was responsible my entire time there, almost, of uh, my entire time, I was responsible for the re service and retention of our season ticket holder base. So here, I do not have that responsibility here in Golden State. We have a wonderful gentleman that um, oversees it here. So I really understand the value of the season ticket member. They can be up to 80% of your or higher um, of your gate um, at a game, right? And some depend, it just depends on the number of season ticket holders you have. So that, that's not across the board, <clears throat> but they can, it can be that. So that tells you the value in terms of the revenue, and then there's value because then they tune in for the away games. They buy your your merchandise. They buy the James Wiseman jersey, like he's our, he's our new outstanding rookie we have here at the Warriors. So your season ticket base is um, critical. On the topic of ticketing, how have companies like StubHub and these online ticket brokers, What's the relationship that teams and leagues have with those with those companies? Are they seen as partners or are they seen as kind of a, a thing that you have to contend with? What you saw in the industry is an evolution of brokers, you know, and um, there's a lot of them. You know, it's arbitrage. It's taking taking advantage of that. I mean, it, it's really smart because um, <laughs> teams were slow to adopt dynamic pricing of season tickets. Um, individual games were, ticket prices were the first thing that people did. But that arbitrage is what people took advantage of because typically with season ticket members, they do get a little bit of a discount on their tickets because they're buying so many and, and their loyalty, right? Um, so what I say is that that industry has undergone, um, I mean, it's had such a major impact that I think they started out as the bad guy. They are seen as, you know, more innovators. And I think the, the industry itself is coming to accept that they're not bad guys. Like they're, they're not, there are some very sophisticated, like the stub hubs um, and others. There's some very sophisticated, uh, I'll use the term brokers, although I think they, you know, ticket resellers might be the better, a better term for them these days. Um, who, who can help your business and you can partner with them. Um, so I think that whole industry has evolved from the shadows, you know, selling across the street at that, you know, there, there's still certainly that set of, of folks, but there's a very sophisticated data centric group um, that my experience in Miami um, can be good partners, uh, but you have to figure out how to address them and how to work with them and find the best ones. When was the first time you met Mickey Arison? Wow, great question. It would have to be in 1996 when I first joined uh, the Heat organization. Um, Mickey became the majority owner um, at that time, and there was a, a little bit of a shift, and we had a couple of meetings about ticket prices and 
some team business and, and I was in that meeting. And what I, re- what I know about when you meet with Mickey and, and listen, his son, Nick Arison, um, is running the business um, more on a day-to-day basis. These and, and wonderful. I'm a Carolina gr- undergrad and he's a Duke undergrad. So I put that aside uh, <laughs> and I got my MBA from UM. But I, I say Nick because Nick is wonderful and they are amazing owners. But the, but the thing I always remember you know, Mickey runs a multinational uh, conglomerate and he is, they are so wonderful, kind. Um, but, but, you know, they, there's that saying, don't mistake my kindness for weakness. They are it just, they've got some of the best bankers, attorneys in the world that work with them. So I would always, if I was having a ticket pricing conversation with Mickey, there, there were times I had to do that. I would study like it was, uh, I was prepping for a college final exam because he would always, he, he was, you know, he listens and listens, he, exceptional listeners. And then they, he would always ask the one question that you would, weren't prepared for. So you had to over prepare as you should. At, like that's just should be your standard approach anyway, especially this is, these are multi-million dollar vent, ventures and, and some of them billion dollar uh, ventures these days. So you have to be prepared. So I've just always, I, I worked for her one of the best owners uh, in the NBA. And now I work for probably one of the, they're in the top two, the, the Warriors, the Arisons and Joe Lacob and Peter Gruber clearly in the top two in terms of owners. What, what are their similarities? The, those two ownership groups, do you think? Uh, dedication to winning, like a, a, a strong dedication to winning. It doesn't, it doesn't ebb and flow. It's always about let's, let's go and get the best talent. And that goes both on the court and in the um, off business office space, the executive spaces. So it's a dedication to winning. It's a dedication. They empower their people. They don't micromanage. You know, you, we've all read the stories about Jerry Jones, not to say that, that he does that. Maybe he doesn't do it anymore, but you know, he's, he's very much front and center. Um, both organizations empower their executives. They give you the resources to be successful. Um, and, and that's, that's something as, as a executive, it gives me like the opportunity to really excel and, and, and pursue what I think are the right business strategies. Uh, so there's, there's that. And then I would just say, you know, how humble they are. Like they are really modest, humble people considering the types of businesses they run. And they're very charitable. Both organizations have a deep belief in the community and giving back to the community. Um, and that we see in both, especially this summer during the whole Black Lives Matter movement, you know, there's just this ongoing deep commitment to the community that already existed and has just continued to be expanded. So I would say those are the, the main traits. And in your role as the GM for the arena, whether that was at, at, at the, with the Heat or now, how often are you in conversation with the owner of the team so in in that role specifically in let's quote normal times you know not much just um that they typically tend to spend more time on the business i'm mean, sorry the basketball side um so don't get me wrong but i report to the president the president in both organizations i report to the president and the president spends a lot of time with the owners um we would just on you know project-based needs um have interactions with them you know see them at games see them at concerts make sure that you know, everything they need is taken care of in, in terms of their experience. Um, now, COVID, the, my new normal is, I'm on two calls a week with uh, Joe Lacob and Peter Cooper talking about what's our plan, with our strategy. So it's, um, it's, been, it's been wonderful. I enjoyed this access and opportunity. I've enjoyed the, getting to know them uh, through this sort of crisis uh, time. So now it's, it, it's twice a week. Uh, with the owners here, that's out of necessity because of the situation, the fluid nature of COVID. And does that also say something about the centrality of the Chase Center and the success of the uh, of the enterprise moving forward? Do you think? Oh, I um, absolutely right. The, the, I always say at at Chase Center and even at American Airlines Arena, the number one thing we do is actually not host NBA games and concerts. The number one thing we do is uh, provide a safe environment, and so making sure people come and have a good time and have a safe environment and leave and, and everybody is safe. So it used to be that we had to protect against, you know, the physical threats, you know, of, of, of just large gatherings, right. That, that are, are terrorist targets, quite honestly. Now we add to that this invisible enemy called COVID 
Um, and that is something, you know, that can be, you know, transmitted not as much by touch, but that's part of it. So it really is, um, and large mass gatherings are an issue um, and concern. We were the first to go into shelter in place. We'll probably be among the last to come out of shelter in place um, in events. So we understand and we have to make sure our goal here at Chase Center is to be viewed as the state safest arena when we come out, when we emerge from COVID. So we've implemented all of the protocols and more. Um, and an example is our air filtration system, which is, is something that is a focus for indoor situations. We've got one of the most advanced state-of-the-art, um, what, what's called HVAC, heating, <laughs> ventilation, air conditioning systems in the arenas. I'm getting into my tech talk here, but um, <laughs> so this is my world. Uh, so we, we've modified how that operates so that we can bring as much outside air into the venue without creating an uncomfortable environment, right? So that keeps that, the air flushing through the venue. And then we've got, within that system, we've got filters that are called MERV 15 filters. And so MERV 13 filters uh, trap the virus uh, or trap virus. And then MERV 15, 15 just tells you how much extra we're doing. So, you know, we're doing, every, we look at, we know, you would be amazed at the conversations I've had with engineers about, you know, cubic volume of space of air and how it flows and how it rotates and when we open this door, what it does to the airflow. So it's been pretty sophisticated. So making sure that that environment through that type of um, new operations continues to create a safe environment that people feel coming in that they are going to be safe. And, and quite honestly, you know, we will certainly be safer than there's been some models done, not on Chase Center but some models run that that have um shown that that there's that coming to an event at, at these arenas with certain protocols in place uh is among one of the safest things you can do but it's it's getting people psychologically there right it's like there's it's that it's going to take some time because this is a psychological um mental approach as much as it is because there's been so much information we've been in this for so long that sort of Cutting through, if you recall, there was a time where face masks were, were recommended, it was recommended against, it was on the CDC website, you do not have to wear face masks. And now that's sort of, a, it is a recommendation by the CDC. So things have changed, that change of information has confused people, but we do um, customer sentiment surveys uh, every, about every, once every like six to eight weeks. And so we watch the trend lines and we watch things that have gone up in concern and things that have come down in concern. Um, so we, we have our finger on the pulse. You, you mentioned, you know, you're in this meeting, you're in meetings with presidents of the team, with the Miami Heat, the CEO, the, 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 the owner of the team. But you started with the Heat as a member of the stats crew, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> yeah. right? <laughs> it's true. Uh, it so, is. It's and that, that's maybe not so surprising considering the, the, the coach of the team started as a video coordinator. So I guess they like to hire a pin, but um, how did you end up in that role? Why did you end up, you were in the, on the marketing media side of things initially? It's a great, it's so funny. And you're right. I, I forgot Spo was um, video coordinator because he's done such a great job as a head coach. We were little, he was hired about two weeks before I was at the Heat organization. And we both, and then Pat Riley was hired about a month after I was hired. Um, so it was just sort of somewhat just um, good timing and good fortune in, in life. Did you get to know, did you work with Spolstra on a regular basis? Oh yeah. Yes. I, I, I was, I'm not in basketball operations, but my first, so I'll tell you my first quick history there. I'll take you from, I started on the stats crew while I was still working full-time at the University of Miami in the sports information department. And so as a part-time gig, I would work on the stats crew at Miami Heat Games. And I, I really enjoyed that. And still, the, the vast majority of people I worked with on the stats crew back in 1996, I saw them on the TV the other night. They're still there. <laughs> they're, they're great people. Um, so I started there and what happened is when Mickey became majority owner, there was a gentleman, Andy Ellisberg, who was now the general manager for the basketball team for the Heat. He was in the PR department and he shifted over to basketball operations. And that, that opening is the opening that I was, gave me my first job with the Miami Heat. So I was an assistant sports uh, information director, I think is, it was the title. And so, and then Pat was hired a month later. So it was just this great timing um, and that's, that's how I started. That's, so I did stay true to my roots because my undergrad degree is journalism and PR. And so I was fortunate, 
had that opportunity to, and that's how I started. It's been four years. It was during, for those of those with long memories and, uh, and who are Heat fans may remember the Tim Hardaway, Alonzo Mourning, um, PJ Brown, and the, the infamous fights with the Knicks in the playoffs and, you know, Zoe missing the playoff game. <laughs> that, that time was the time that I was um, traveling with the team and really enjoyed it. It was a, an amazing time to be behind the scenes and to get that kind of knowledge with Pat. Um, I really value the time that I had uh, to be around him. And when I left um, the heat to come out here, I got a really nice handwritten letter from Pat, you know, just wishing me all the luck. Um, and so, you know, that's just that, that organization in Miami is just about loyalty and everybody, even though I hadn't worked with Pat for more than 10 years, you know, he, he watched, he said, you know, I saw how you ran the building and I saw what you did. And, you know, they're, they're you know, they're really lucky to have you, blah, 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 which is really nice. He didn't have to do that. Right. Pat took time out of his day to send it to me. So I really have made some great friends. I love that organization. So, so happy they made it to the finals last year. Sorry, they didn't, we were rooting for them. Um, but it's been a great career. So you said you were hired uh, around the same time as Eric Spolstra mm -hmm. and when you first met him and be honest, what was your impression of him? Because he probably wasn't at that time, not like he was being groomed to be a head coach in the NBA. What, what was your impression of Eric Spolster the first time you met him? So we were about the same age, right? We were in our twenties. Um, and I remember him as a hard worker and I, what I remember vividly. So great guy. We were about the same age. We had same, the same, a same sort of circle of friends. He, he had a tight circle of friends and I had friends that I was around that circle, so to speak. So, so we knew it. when you're in your twenties, you're like, Hey, you're going to the bar, you see each other, right? That, that sort of thing, right? It's just, it's Miami. That's what you do. Um, but I, I remember once we would come back from a, um, a trip and you know, these are, these are charter flights. So you're landing at like 4 a.m. And at that time, it was the signature air on the opposite side of Miami International Airport. You're landing at 4 a.m. You're bleary-eyed because you just came from Detroit or wherever, <laughs> wherever you were on a road trip. And it's 4 a.m. And there's Spo, uh, Spo, and he had a stack of cassettes, right? Because it, it's all digitized now, but it was all these cassettes. And he would hand it to Stan Van Gundy, and he'd hand some to Pat. And that was, that was all he had taken that prior night's game and chopped it up into these um, specific segments and was giving them to the various coaches so that they could re watch them prior to the morning, the practice the next day. So, um, so that just tells you, I mean, that means he spent all night working and he was splicing together a video. Like now it's, it's, it's much easier. It's much more sophisticated. Um, so what I, what I remember of Spo, always a hard worker, always somebody, but always really pleasant, a very humble guy, very humble. He deserves, um, a lot of credit for just his coaching prowess and knowledge and experience. He, he's just brilliant. And I think cause he's so humble and kind that I think again, um, people don't recognize and understand that like he, to me, he is the Phil Jackson of this generation. Like he has done so, generation of coaches. He has done such an amazing job. He's managed some amazing, yes, he's had some incredible talent to work with, but he's also had talent that, um, and he can get the best out of them. And so I, I give him just tons of credit. He deserves every bit of it. And I don't think some people in the media in particular really acknowledge that. They just say, well, you had LeBron James, so you won. No, you, you got to manage those egos. You got to manage that process. And that, that's not easy. It comes with its own set of, you know, um, opportunities, let's say. We thank Kim Stone for joining the Miami Herbert Huddle. So much more from that fascinating conversation, including a crazy story about a young Dwayne The Rock Johnson, can be found on the Miami Herbert YouTube channel. Just type Miami Herbert Business School into the YouTube search bar and you'll find it. Kim Stone has an MBA from Miami Herbert Business School, and you can too. Visit herbert.miami.edu. That's herbert, H-E-R-B-E-R-T, dot Miami, dot edu to learn more. The only constant in life is change. Change is a dynamic force that moves through everything, our personal lives, our professions, and the roiling markets of the world economy. How we adapt to this change and how we reinvent ourselves in response will define us, especially when that change produces a trial and the things required of us are so tough. Our city of Miami has shown resilience in the face of many trials and has used those moments to propel profound transformation. To harness the forces of transformation, we need to build resilient leaders 
who have the knowledge and courage to change everything. Here at the Miami Herbert Business School, we're preparing the next generation of leaders for the bright future that will lie ahead once this trial is passed. We're prepared to confront the unknown. And we're here to help you build your future. The Chase Center is one of the most sustainable arenas in the United States. The roof collects rainwater and gray water is recovered from the showers and bathrooms around the center and then reused. Even the condensation from the AC units is collected and recycled. All told, water usage has been reduced by 85 percent. The HVAC system is very complex. In order to follow California's strict environmental codes, and last July, the Chase Center was only the fifth NBA arena to be awarded a gold LEED certification. Now, obviously, sustainability is no longer just a trend. It is a reality that all businesses are having to reckon with and lead on. So to talk more about the move towards sustainable businesses and sports is Professor Daniel Hicks from the Miami Herbert Business School. I have to start out all my courses uh, by explaining that sustainability is short for sustainable development, uh, which is a field of economics. So really sustainable business is how companies, large and small, fit into this area of economic reform. That's really what sustainable development uh, is all about. It's what are best practices out there in terms of promoting well-being, not only for business and the economy, but for where uh, the economy actually lives, and that's within our society. So uh, this is obviously a sports podcast about the business of sports, and we just talked to Kim Stone the uh, general manager of the Chase Center in uh, San Francisco, California. And uh, the Chase Center is a beautiful new building, two years old, uh, one of the most uh, highly touted, quote-unquote, sustainable sporting venues in the U.S. Generally, and I know you're not an engineer and you haven't, you haven't done the measurements at the, at the venue, but generally, what are some things that uh, you're starting to see some trends in physical places, you know, whether they're venues or... Uh, sporting arenas or whatever it is, what are some of the sustainability elements that, that you're starting to see come through? Mm -hmm. Well, it, what's interesting is that um, many of the things you're, you're uh, asking about have already been incorporated into a lot of architectural design and zoning laws and things of that kind. Um, and so for the built environment, really the, the question of um, water conservation, energy savings, uh, lighting, uh, air quality. A lot of these things now have taken kind of a, a front seat, if you will, in terms of the planning and design of buildings of all kinds. Sporting uh, venues are no exception. Um, but, you know, certifications like LEED, and now we see the, the, the well certification emerging, which is going beyond the physical um, structure, but also the environment in which that building exists and the quality of life in that uh, structure um, is where a lot of attention is being placed. And so in real estate, you know, for example, um, developers are no longer just looking at, you know, a return, financial return, but they're looking at environmental and social benefits that come about as a result of um, the investments they make in that built environment. So there's, there's a variety of certifications that are now becoming standard, I think, in the built environment. And some of them are very technical, so I don't know if you want to get into them here. Um, but that's really what you're seeing is an emphasis on quality of life and well-being that's being incorporated now more and more into the design of, of modern buildings. So COVID obviously is the elephant in the room, I'm sure, for most companies. And post-COVID, the way things are going to be, whether the way we look at office space, the way we look at the way apartments are constructed, uh, whatever it is. I mean, what are some of the trends? How is COVID a catalyst, do you think, for sustainability? Yeah, it's very much a catalyst. It's a huge catalyst. I, I just finished a talk and was explaining that there's four large ones, really. There's climate, there's social justice, 
there's technology, and there's public health. These catalysts are driving sustainable agendas. And uh, in the terms of COVID, I mean, it basically highlighted how unhealthy, you know, our uh, way of life really has become in terms of our supply chains, the way we uh, compensate essential workers and define essential workers. Um, you know, so it really highlighted a lot of the economic disparities that we kind of knew were there all along. But in terms of COVID being a catalyst, it's really the public health agenda. It's really reminding everybody just how essential health and how we define individual health, community health, um, uh, is to what we're doing. If we don't have our health, everything else pretty much stops, right? If we're not feeling well, then you know it pretty much we can look at our schedule and wipe everything off of it because we're just not up to it. And if we don't have that sense of health and well-being, then everything else begins to unravel. And so I think what COVID's done is it's returned this idea of health and well-being as the central purpose for the economies that have developed, really. It's to have produced a standard of living for people over time that was better than before. And why was it better? Well, because we invented medicines, we had healthier food, we were doing all these things that were supposedly making our lives not only easier, but also uh, increasing our lifespans at the same time. Is there an area, do you think, of sports in particular uh, that sustainability uh, really touches? Oh, yeah, I think sports is central. Uh, in fact, I have a whole session on green sports a week from tomorrow at my fourth annual CSO Summit and Symposium, which I hope I'll see you there. Um, uh, but sports has been, green sports has been central to this shift. Sustainability runs all the way through the industry and entertainment. And I'll give you some examples. I actually made a list for you before this, before this conversation. Um, you mentioned the stadiums already, but it's really the way that these, these teams and franchises have um, access to the fans. They can influence all of the folks in all the cities that they across they, that they you know that they play in with a sense of consciousness about the environment and about you know sustainability. That's number one. So it's really that fan engagement, which has been heightened through digital, right? We've seen athletes develop large followings online and have tremendous influence when it comes to especially social issues, commentary around that. We saw many athletes step out and, and speak up around the Black Lives Matter movement, right? Uh, um, last summer, I guess it was. So they're very active and LeBron James is a good example of players speaking out and saying, I'm not just an athlete. I'm gonna make comments about politics and, and causes that I believe in. That's about, that's about the social side of sustainability. That's about that consciousness I was talking about, the shift that's really driving the, the agenda to some extent. It's really people's own attitudes about what's right and what's wrong, right? That sense of morality. But the NFL has been involved in green activities for a long time. They have actually a whole division called NFL Green. So diversity and inclusion also, I mean, the elevation of, you know, um, uh, you know black culture and black talent. I mean, that's been on display for a long, long time. So that consciousness and that idea of impact as well, impact investment, we're seeing players getting involved and in making contributions to move their communities, their own communities forward or, or communities that have been you know, marginalized or forgotten. Athletes are central to that shift that's happening around community development. Union representation, right? I mean, the, the players unions are very strong voices in support of labor rights, right? And their union is one of the strongest in the country. So they have a huge voice again in that social area that is involved with ESG. And uh, lastly, we see companies like Viacom CBS signing climate action uh, pledges. We see the Surfing Association, the World Surfing Association get behind ocean conservation. That's a sport, right? So 
why we catch a uh, cast a wide net and then, and then circle back to the idea that these stadiums, Yankee Stadium, ATT Stadium, they're all examples of this well-built environment I was talking about, well, W-E-L-L. That's really kind of the next evolution beyond just lead certification on these buildings we were talking about, where we're talking about you know, how to save money on lighting and energy and water. Really, it's about creating a more inclusive, healthy environment all around that engages with the community that happens to be part of where that building might reside. So all those points that sports touches on, I think are, are you know, a source of a much richer conversation than this. That's it for this episode of the Miami Herbert Huddle. Thanks again to Kim Stone and Daniel Hicks for being our guests. New episodes of the show are uploaded every other Thursday. So be sure to subscribe to our feed on your favorite podcast app in order to get it in the future. And be sure to rate and even give a review of the show if you have a few seconds. The podcast won't be sustainable if you don't help out. The producer of the Miami Herbert Huddle is Marlene Liebisch. Special thanks to Dean John Quelch and Vice Deans Henrik Kronkvist and DJ Nanda. Additional production support is provided by Rise News Brand Studio. I'm Rich Robinson. We'll see you next time on the Miami Herbert Huddle.